thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's, it's great to be back at EMF after a, a big break. Um, so I'm going to do a talk today on, on hovering rockets. Explain what those are in a second. Uh, the, uh, this is the subtitle, uh, which is uh, how to go from a sketchy hobby project to a funded European Space Agency program uh, in half a lifetime. So when you think of hovering rockets these days, this is what everyone probably thinks, thinks of. This is one of SpaceX's Falcon 9 uh, rockets landing on a pad. And uh, it needs to be able to steer itself such that it can reverse back down onto the, uh, onto the launch pad. And that involves uh, a bit of complexity. So another application of hovering rockets, this is the Mars uh, One Artist rendition, I think, of the uh, Mars uh, Perseverance uh, lander. So to land on Mars, the problem you have is the atmosphere is very thin. So while well, you can use it to slow down initially when you're at a high Mach number, when you want to actually touch down on the surface, you need some retro rockets. Um, there are other ways of doing it. You can crash into the surface with a big airbag or something like that. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a slightly more elegant way of arriving at Mars. And this needs um, a rocket system where you can control the stability of it very, very precisely. Uh, and you have to do that without the aid of much atmosphere. So a brief introduction to rockets. You probably know, and most of you know all this stuff uh, here already, but rockets basically work by ejecting stuff out the back. So it's, this, is, this is Newton's third law. Uh, so you have some stuff in your rocket, you accelerate it to high speed, you push it out the back, and that reacts against the rocket and causes it to move in the other direction. So, sorry, here's an equation. So, thrust is the rate of change of momentum. And momentum is velocity times mass. So, rate of change of momentum is velocity times mass flow rate. So, what the V means is that's how fast you're chucking your propellant out the back. And the M dot is the rate of stuff that you're chucking out, chucking out the back. So, how many kilograms per second are you getting rid of? And it turns out, because rockets uh, store their fuel on board them, you really need to worry about mass and optimizing that. So it turns out what you want is a very high V and a relatively small M dot to get a certain amount of thrust, and that way you get an efficient rocket. Sorry, that's a jellyfish. Um, dynamics. Um, so um, you, you don't have to pay attention to this diagram. It's just really a kind of a, a cue to uh, introduce a little bit of the, uh, the background to, to what's involved in making a rocket hover. So. Um, I have, a, I have a thing here, which I'll explain more about later, but believe it or not, uh, this is actually a rocket. And in the bottom here is a, this is a rocket motor that you can insert in. It's not loaded at the moment, so it's perfectly safe. Uh, but that's a solid propellant rocket. And obviously the thrust causes the rocket to go up. Now, there's a common misconception that balancing a rocket or controlling a rocket is like balancing a pendulum on your hand, sort of like that. Actually, it's a slightly easier problem. The rocket isn't really, uh, that's, that's a completely unstable system, statically unstable, so it'll just fall over. The more it falls over, the more the thrust, the gravity is acting upwards. The rocket doesn't work like that, it's actually in free fall. So your rocket, if you, if you let go of it, it's actually going to fall like this. And the rocket won't rotate unless you do something uh, to, uh, to make it do that. And that's another example of Newton's third law that applied to rotational systems rather than linear systems. So if I steer the rocket engine this way, that's going to cause a reaction that will make the rocket go the other way like that. If I steer it this way, it'll react back that way. So that's roughly how the dynamics work. Um, and what happens is when you gimbal the rocket, it's called gimbling, by the way, so you're swiveling the rocket engine, that puts a proportion of the thrust in a sideways direction, and that's what causes the rocket to turn. And what happens is that the, that thrust will cause the rocket to turn faster and faster and faster and faster. So it's the angular acceleration that's proportional to thrust. So that's enough dynamics. Um, this is how you deal with it. So this is a, a little control diagram. Uh, I don't have a pointer here, but on the left in the blue box, you've got the, an IMU. That's an inertial measurement unit. So that, that's essentially a thing that measures what way up the rocket is. You've then got a controller which makes sense of that data from the IMU, and then you finally got some actuators which will do something to the rocket. Now, in the one I just showed you, that's called a gimbal actuator, but you can also use cold gas jets um, and all sorts of other methods to actually steer the rocket. 
Um, that then feeds back through the vehicle dynamics, so it makes the rocket do something. That then changes the readings that you get on the sensors. And the sensors that you'd have there um, would usually be um, three-axis gyros and three-axis accelerometers. So gyros give you rate of change of angle, and accelerometers give you rate of change of uh, speed, or sideways directions and up-down directions. So this is a little bit of history, sort of how this project started. Um, it started when I was a student, or I think I was just moving into my first job also at a university. And um, I was really inspired by this thing. So this is a thing called the Delta Clipper, McDonnell Douglas DCX. Uh, it then became part of the NASA program. Uh, it sadly didn't, didn't go very far. Uh, they had a couple of accidents with it, um, which wasn't really anyone's fault. The, the essential design was very sound. And this was a rocket that could take off and it could move sideways and it could land again on a pad. And it was a, a technology demonstrator for all sorts of different things. It was built very quickly in a very cost-effective manner. Um, and it's really um, a, good, a good example of how to run a, a really quick, cheap aerospace Space program that does something really amazing. So the question is, so, so I, I, there I was without access to modern MEMS gyroscopes, or they were just becoming available for model helicopter pilots. So this is going back to 1995 sort of time. Um, so the big problem with is how you make a gyro so the rocket can tell which way up it is. Um, and this for somebody who's essentially operating uh, in a basement with limited tools and technology, is it's a really hard problem. And I found this article from HPR Rocketry magazine. Sorry, there's a spider right there in front of me, which is great, so you can go over here, dude. Um, and um, these guys in America, also amateur rocketry people like, like I was, they figured out you could buy a thing from Edmund Scientific, which was a little tiny uh, magnetic disc with little magnetic poles around it, and you could put it on a little jewel bearing and spin it up to really high speed with some coils. Now, I discovered in the UK it was hard to get stuff from Edmund Scientific, and I didn't know how to import this thing and where it came from and exactly how to get hold of it. So I started looking around for other sketchy alternatives to this, and I came up with this. So you may, if you're a cyclist, recognize this. This is called a bottle dynamo, and the idea is it rubs against your tire and it makes electricity to run the lights on your bicycle. And it turns out that inside one of these, in the, in the little bottle bit, um, there's actually a rotor. And you can see there on the right-hand side, uh, that's the rotor there. It's about 30 millimeters diameter. And it's got four north poles and four south poles. And it spins in a coil to generate electricity. So um, I thought, aha, what if we turn this the other way around? Um, and so I started to try some experiments. The next problem was how to actually get a low friction bearing. And I discovered that the um, end of a propelling pencil was really good because it has a little bit of graphite sticking out. So you have a graphite bearing, which is self-lubricating. Um, so this all sounds really sketchy because it is. Um, but amazingly, it kind of works. So there's a diagram of it there. You can see that it has some coils around the outside to, uh, to spin the uh, dynamo disc up. Uh, it sits on a little adjustable pivot. And underneath are some infrared sensors, which measure how far away the disc is from the, from the, uh, the sensors. And by amplifying those differentially, you can then figure out what angle it is. And if you put this together, you end up with this sketchy looking thing, which is made out of hot melt glue and balsa wood and epoxy resin. And, all the sort of things you do when you're bodging things together when you're a student. But um, amazingly, it actually works. So it's just spinning up there. The, the idea is it's got a, a, those little silver strips on the outside, uh, detected by a little infrared detector on the side. That then pulses current through those red coils, and that will then spin it up. And I think in a minute, I'm going to pick that up and sort of move it around. And, so you can see an example of what's called gyroscopic rigidity. So you can move the rocket around, but the gyroscope stays still. And that's what allow, how, how, you, how it allows you to measure the attitude of the rocket. There's one big disadvantage of this, as you can no doubt guess, which is because it's sitting on a pivot, as soon as the th rocket stops thrusting, it jumps off the end of the pivot and it whizzes around inside the rocket, which is not great for it. But amazingly, it kind of works. So this is just roughly what the inside of the rocket looks like. Um, so it's pretty old school. So there's a gyro. It feeds a, a little microcontroller. That operates two radio control servos, which then gimbal the engine around. And here's a, a, a film of it, a uh, film with a potato, because uh, potatoes are all we really had back in the late 1990s. So you can see it's sort of stable, doesn't go very high, parachute comes out, doesn't really have time to open, and that's it. 
but it kind of worked. So, oh, there's another jellyfish. Gyro number two. Um, then, by this time, uh, the micro machine silicon sensors became available. And uh, these, are, these allow you to get a solid state gyroscope, which doesn't need any moving parts. And that really transformed everything. And so, that, we then ended up with this thing. Let's see if I can take it apart. So, there's an outer shell which was homemade out of some fiberglass wound around a drain pipe. The, the, little, the little brackets on the side were actually for retro rockets. They're, they're not there anymore because it turns out that it causes it to chase you across the, the ground. <laughs> um, so that's the inside of the rocket. You've got the two sensors on the back. You can see they're, they're orthogonal to each other, so they're 90 degrees. It only measures the... Um, oop, just broken it. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> This is all made out of model aircraft stuff um, and model boat stuff, which is great because it means it's really easy to fix. Uh, so the gyros on the back there uh, go into a little microcontroller there, which is a PIC microcontroller, and um, that operates two servos here. And if I'm very lucky, if I had a bit of tape here, Got some tape here to stop the engine falling out because it's only a push fit at the moment. Turn that on. Let's see. This may or may not work because I've done something to it. I made it sad. Yep, demo error. Sorry, that worked perfectly minutes ago, but now it stopped. But uh, basically, the idea is when it tilts one way, it'll move the motor the other way to, to correct. Um, that's, that's disappointing. There we are. Demo effect in action. This is what it looks like when it flies. Uh, again, sorry about the potato quality here. Is that going to play? Let's see. I'm not sure that you're getting any sound on there. Pick up the sound from my laptop. So you can see that that one, uh, that performed a lot better, uh, thanks to the solid state gyros. But, thank you very much. Oops. <laughs> Just gone out of my presentation. Um, so, the problem is, if you really want to make a, ho a rocket hover, it's not enough just to control the, uh, the direction of the thrust, you have to control the amount of thrust as well. So you have to throttle the, the engine. And um, this led on to uh, a brief but abortive project called Gyroc 3, which I have here. Um, this, this is a coaxial hybrid rocket engine with a, a pintle injector that you can throttle. It turns out, though, that you've then got a problem with thrust vectoring. You need some sort of jet vanes. And that turned out to be a bit complicated. And things were moving on, and I wanted to try out Viprox. Um, by this time, I'd end up uh, starting up a small company and uh, had some other people around to help me who really wanted to uh, join in the, in the fun and see what we could make with bits that we had lying around the workshop. So we came up with this thing, which is Gyroc 5. Um, so it's a gimbaled bipropellant throttleable motor and it runs on nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas. That's the oxidizer and isopropyl alcohol. And those two burn together in a combustion chamber and produce hot gases out the nozzle and that provides the thrust. And it, it's got a thrust of about 30, uh, sorry, 300 newtons, which is about 30 kilos. So that's the diagram you saw earlier on, the, uh, the control system diagram of, of the rocket, when it was back when it was really, really simple, um, and you only had to worry about uh, the, the attitude of the rocket. When you have to worry about the, uh, the, the throttling it as well, and uh, trying to make sure that the IMU doesn't drift, you need a whole bunch more sensors, and you have the challenge of putting that data together. And you use a thing called a Kalman filter, um, and that's basically a device that is able to 
adjust the amount it trusts different sources, sources of data depending on what it thinks the accuracy uh, of that data is. And it turns out, by some very complicated math, which I'm absolutely not going to bore you with, um, it turns out that's an optimal solution for uh, dealing with this kind of problem where you've got lots of different sensors and some are good in a short time span and some are good in a long time span. Um, and it's, it's a way of getting the, the best of all worlds. Um, what the actual diagram looks like, so that, bearing in mind this is the Gyrop 1 and 2 diagram, this is the diagram for Gyrop 5, uh, which is considerably uh, more complicated. Uh, so it has this Kalman filter that estimates its state, so how fast is it, what angle is it, and then it has uh, a couple of um, different control loops for um, altitude and, uh, and, altitude, uh, and, and velocity, um, and it's got similar control loops for the, the attitude, which is its angle. And that allows it to do something like this. Now, this is just tethered. We haven't let Gyrock 5 off the tether yet, because if we have to abort it because something goes wrong, it's quite an expensive thing if it crashes. So we have a tether here with a bungee on it. And uh, this is what it looks like. She's supposed to be another video in there, but that seems to have gone missing. So I, um, I, I don't know whether you noticed that it drifted off to one side. That's because it actually lost GPS lock. We put a very tight um, constraint on how accurate the satellite lock needs to be in order to, for it to trust it, and it decided it wasn't going to trust it. So it starts to drift off, and then when it reacquires lock, it comes right back to the middle where it should be. So I think... Let me just see if that's all I've got. Yeah, sorry, I don't have the other video. Um, so I've got to say thank you to um, all my colleagues at Airborne Engineering who've done all the really hard work. Um, they're fellow nerds and makers like me who've, who've um, also got a passion for rocketry. Um, and they've been absolutely instrumental in making this, this project happen. I really, it's, it's, it's really an example of uh, how you can make a start on, uh, on something on your own, but it gets to a certain level of complexity and it's just much um, much easier and more fun to have other people involved. I also need to thank the European Space Agency who've given us some money to actually start um, playing with something that was originally my hobby, and so that's really gratifying, and the UK Space Agency as well who dealt with all the paperwork for making that happen. So, thank you very much.